Today we're gonna to do another sort of specific video uh, covering another part of uh, crucible steel making. Um, and this time we're gonna be talking a little bit about the source of carbon for your uh, crucible steel. Uh, I'm going to assume that uh, folks are aiming to make uh, something similar to uh, what is sort of commonly uh, referred to as woots, um, which Carbon content range uh, historically was like 1.2% carbon up to about 1.8% carbon. Um, you can make higher carbon steels than that, um, but it becomes increasingly tricky once you go past 1.8% carbon. And uh, below 1.2% carbon, uh, you're going to start to run into issues where uh, you don't have enough carbides uh, present to really get a good uh, pattern, a good visible pattern. Also, you know, kind of whole reason to make woots uh, for most folks is uh, they want the performance that uh, those carbides provide. So once you go, you know, once you're dropping into lower carbon levels, you really lose those carbides, you lose that uh, particular characteristic. So uh, first, uh, a lot of folks have asked me what type of crucible I use. Um, this is a Salamander A6, which is the size designation and shape designation. Uh, it is a clay graphite crucible. Uh, they're sometimes referred to as just graphite crucibles, but uh, you want to make sure that you get a clay graphite crucible rather than a straight graphite crucible. Those are out there. They are not suitable for melting iron. Um, iron consumes carbon pretty rapidly. Uh, similarly, uh, silicon carbide crucibles, not great for uh, the crucible steel process, simply because, again, the molten iron can uh, consume silicon carbide at a pretty uh, rapid pace. So um, both of those, you're gonna really throw off your chemistry and in the case of graphite crucibles, like pure graphite crucibles, from talking to folks who have used them, uh, they don't last very long. So I'm gonna set this aside for a minute so I don't knock it over. Um, two most common sources of carbon uh, in making crucible steel uh, would be this is pig iron. This is actually sorrel metal pig iron. So that's S-O-R-E-L. Go ahead, look it up. Uh, it's a very high grade pig iron. And uh, what this basically means uh, for me is that it has very low impurity levels. Um, so very low phosphorus, very low sulfur, very low manganese. That means I know what I've got in my final uh, material using uh, the pig iron, uh, the sorrel metal pig iron. Uh, another uh, good source of carbon is charcoal. And I, I've done quite a few melts where my only extra carbon came uh, from charcoal. Uh, both of these are historically accurate uh, methods of carburizing your ingot. Um, so, uh, both were used. I, you know, I couldn't tell you which was more prevalent um, or whether that prevalence changed uh, based on, you know, geographic location or uh, time period. Um, so those are questions for somebody else. Uh, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about, uh, you know, sort of pluses and minuses of both and best way to use either one. So uh, I'm gonna start with the charcoal. It's more readily available. So uh, for folks just getting into this, that's probably uh, gonna be your first step uh, on the road to making crucible steel. Um, so advantage of using charcoal, easy to find. Uh, another advantage is it comes with very few impurities. Uh, it has been cooked at a high enough temperature that you really shouldn't be looking at uh, much phosphorus or sulfur, which are 
two big no-nos in steel. Um, it will have a small mineral content, um, but generally speaking, uh, not much of an issue. If you think about uh, you know, burning charcoal, how much actual ash is left when it's all said and done, there's really not much there. So, downside of using charcoal, uh, there are actually two that have, or, well, two that I'm going to talk about immediately. There are several. You, you may come across some extras that I haven't discovered yet. Um, so, one big issue with charcoal, uh, it absorbs moisture from the air. So, when you buy it, uh, you know, this piece may weigh five grams, and then when you go to use it, this piece may weigh six grams. Um, the carbon content that you're aiming for is uh, fairly specific. Um, so if you think about it, uh, you know, 1.5%, that's sort of, you know, kind of an average uh, good to aim for, 1.5% 1 1 carbon by weight um, is, you know, doesn't seem that specific until you consider that uh, you are aiming for a range from, say, again, 1.2 to about 1.8, and even within that range, characteristics change drastically. So a 1.4% carbon steel is going to give you a very different result than a 1.6% carbon steel. Um, so when you are dealing in uh, you know, fractions of percentages, 0.2% uh, you know, by weight, um, a small change in the weight of your carbon, so your charcoal in this case, uh, makes a big difference. Uh, another problem that you can run into is inconsistency from piece to piece. Uh, depending on where you're getting your charcoal, uh, it may not all be the same wood species, uh, and it may not all actually get fired to the same temperature. Uh, different, uh, different species of wood uh, it's different species of tree, I mean, uh, have different mineral contents. Uh, generally speaking, uh, hardwood trees have higher mineral content than uh, softwood trees. Similarly, the temperature at which the charcoal is cooked uh, to create it changes uh, how much uh, volatile chemical is left in here. So we'll just think of it as like a tar essentially. Um, and that, you know, those volatiles, they're going to cook out before uh, you have molten iron. So they are not going, you know, they might be mostly carbon, but they are going to uh, essentially evaporate. So they're not going to contribute to the carbon content uh, of your final steel. Um, to give you an idea just how drastic this change can be, um, a, a piece of charcoal cooked at the highest temperature, let's say, we'll just take this one, cooked at the highest temperature that uh, charcoal is normally made at, uh, it'll be almost pure carbon and it'll be five grams, let's say. Um, now, if this was cooked at the lowest temperature at which charcoal is made, uh, it might be 10 grams only five grams of which are the pure carbon that's going to end up in your, uh, in your steel. So charcoal, nice easy source of carbon, very traditional source of carbon, but hard to uh, get really scientific in your amounts. Um, I've run into this a few times where sort of, uh, you know, not thinking about it, my, you know, or Unbeknownst to me, my charcoal had changed weight due to moisture uh, you know, and really threw off uh, my calculations substantially. So, big advantage of a high-grade pig iron like sorrel metal is you know what you've got. The, the carbon in here, it's, it's already locked up. So, uh, when this melts, 
you know how much carbon you've added to your steel. Um, you also know what other impurities you've added, in this case not very much, um, and that makes it uh, much easier to repeat from ingot to ingot uh, and get the same results. Uh, one big difficulty with Woots is that there are uh, dozens of variables, you know, and those are dozens of major variables in the process, and changing one changes your outcome. So the more of those variables you can really lock down, the more uh, likely you are to uh, get a consistent result. Or let's say uh, your ingot goes poorly, doesn't work well. Maybe you know now <laughs> why it didn't work out well. At least you know what was in there. Um, similarly, if it goes really well for some reason, you know what was in there, so you've got a pretty good idea, uh, or at least a starting point. Uh, one difficulty with using charcoal, very often, you don't know exactly what was in there, so uh, that can be a real problem. Um, big downside of uh, sorrel metal or other high-grade pig iron. This stuff just is hard to get. Um, it is... Uh, it's widely available at the industrial level, but it is very difficult to get as uh, a knife maker. Um, if you're lucky enough to know somebody who works at a cast iron foundry, uh, or preferably a ductile iron foundry, uh, ductile iron is just a subset of cast iron, um, you might be able to get your hands on it. Uh, other than that, it's a lot of asking around and until you can find a place that will maybe sell you uh, a couple pieces. Um, now, uh, how to use it uh, can be a trick because it comes as a, not a huge ingot, but a, you know, a fairly uh, good size piece and it is insanely hard. Don't try to cut it with a saw. You're, you're going to just hate yourself. Uh, best way that I have found to deal with those uh, ingots or pigs is to heat them up to a nice red color and quench them in water. Uh, this will create all kinds of fractures in that pig and just make the entire thing incredibly brittle. So then you can bust it up with a hammer. Use a hammer you don't like and don't do it on your anvil. Uh, it is going to be much harder than either your anvil or the hammer. So uh, and find a piece, you know, find a piece of granite, find a section of your floor you don't like, or just a plate of steel that doesn't matter if it gets beaten up. Use a cheap hammer. You should be able to break it up into chunks fairly easily. Um, these two get used very differently in the crucible steel making process. I'm going to assume that you are using uh, a combination of a carburizing agent and uh, mild steel. You can use wrought iron, you can use bloomery iron, you can use, you know, whatever. Doesn't matter, it just changes your calculations. Um, using wrought iron or bloomery iron does have one disadvantage in that, uh, again, you don't quite know what you've got. Um, it's a, it's a, you're adding a variable to your uh, chemistry. So, uh, but all things being equal, these are used very differently. So I'm gonna bring my crucible back for a little bit of demonstration. So, or you know, as a visual aid. So if I'm using charcoal, I will have measured out how much I want and it goes at the very bottom of my crucible. And then my wrought iron, whatever it is, goes on top of it preferably in uh, relatively small pieces. Um, and I also want my charcoal to be in relatively small pieces. Uh, they give that, that lower layer, it's good if they mingle together some. And the reason for this is that you're dependent on contact between the charcoal and your wrought iron or mild steel. Uh, for the carbon to uh, pass through uh, into, your, uh, into your steel. 
Um, that can be a slow process. Uh, it really depends a lot on the temperature of your furnace. If you're getting hot enough to just melt mild steel, it'll be fast. Uh, you'll melt your mild steel, it'll carburize with the charcoal, bam, you're done. Um, if, however, uh, you're not really quite hitting that temperature, it may take some time for uh, the, the carbon to make its way into your wrought iron or mild steel, carburize it enough for it to melt. Um, so, basically, uh, using charcoal, you're going to want you know maybe a few pieces of your mild steel, your charcoal, and then the main portion of your wrought iron or mild steel slag on top. Um, if you put your charcoal on top of your wrought iron or steel, it will just float off, you know, float off in the uh, slag. So you'll get none of that carbon uh, contrib you know, contributing to your eventual carbon content. By contrast, using the pig iron, uh, what I want to do is actually put my mild steel or wrought iron in the bottom of the crucible with my pig iron on top of it. Uh, the pig iron will melt at, let's say, you know, 2200 degrees Fahrenheit and then trickle down through your uh, mild steel. And, uh, you know, and what that does essentially is it brings carbon uh, pretty evenly to all of your surfaces uh, early in the process. That carbon then, uh, you know, sort of works its way inward and uh, you get a much faster melt. Um, if you put your pig iron in the bottom and your mild steel on top of it, your pig iron is going to melt early on, leaving a gap because your mild steel will probably kind of forge weld itself together, uh, essentially. It will be hot enough. I believe it's called sintering in, in, in industry. But you'll basically, you'll, you'll create a bridge uh, of your low carbon material. And your high carbon material will just melt away and make a nice puddle. You'll get a gap, which will fill with slag. And then you'll have your uh, low carbon uh, material f sitting above it. You're going to have to achieve a high enough temperature to melt that mild steel in order for it to incorporate into that puddle. Um, creating a bridge like that can be a problem no matter what, it, it happens sometimes. But you can minimize the likelihood of it by putting your mild steel in first, put your pig iron on top. Um, so, uh, that's all we're going to cover uh, in this video. Uh, you should feel free. If you've got questions, uh, you can put them in the comments. Um, I'll try to keep up with those. Uh, you can also uh, find me on Instagram. It's at Peter Burt Knives. You can ask questions there. Look at uh, you know some of what I'm working on. Um, and uh, you know I'll be doing more videos showing some other specific parts of the process. Uh, you know, try to help folks along uh, and get a better idea how this process works. Thanks for watching.